Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. Before I get started, I have one really important thing to say. So I speak a tiny little bit of French so I can, you know, buy coffee or ask for directions. Um, but I've been going to some, uh, some of the talks here in French as well. And I just have to say that cybersecurity sounds so romantic in French that... <laughs> Really, I enjoyed my time, even though I didn't understand anything. It felt wonderful. So thank you so much for doing this. I'm like really excited. And now we're going to talk about, about the cloud and about the fact that everyone's hackable. So a couple things about me. Uh, I'm Shira. I came all the way from Israel. I do cloud. I do security. Um, I'm also a member of the local OSP Israel chapter. I'm uh, co-leading that chapter. Yay! I also saw your booth over here, so it's great to see that uh, we are active everywhere. Um, and also, I'm a great supporter of women in technology and women in cybersecurity. Uh, try to help underrepresented uh, communities, doesn't matter which, uh, to get into cybersecurity because very often it looks like a very, you know, male dominant thing. Obviously, look around you, mostly men in the room, uh, but we're trying to make a difference by helping more people to get into this, this field. So please support your, uh, you know, co-workers, uh, give them a hand, help them learn something new and encourage them to, you know, to be better at what they do. It will also help you to be better at what you do. Uh, we came here to talk about security, and this is kind of a diagram of what the old the good old data center uh, looked like. Uh, back in the days, it was really easy to do security in the on-prem days because all you had to do was really to put uh, some kind of device on your way out to the internet. It's called a firewall. And you felt really safe and really good about it. All the security products we used to have at that time uh, had the word prevention in them. Data leakage prevention. You, you were actually able to prevent uh, hacks from happening because you could control everything that was coming in and out of your data center. And these were very good and naive and happy days, but it's no longer uh, happening that way. We, don't know, we, we can't do security by prevention anymore, or it's not enough these days. Uh, Here is like a bunch of uh, logos of companies you're aware of, you know of, you maybe use some of them. And the common ground of all of them is actually that in the last couple of years, all of them had data breaches. And as you probably know, these companies have really, really big security budget and they can hire any security professional they want and create any security strategy they want and need and still, it happened to them. Now, these are the companies that we know of. The companies who, are, who don't appear here even because they didn't have enough uh, space on the slide, uh, some of the companies uh, are unaware of the fact that they've been hacked. Some of them are being hacked as we speak. Some of them are hacked not for the sake of, uh, of their data. Some of them are hacked because... Um, their competitors wants to know something because they have to, they have to do something with critical infrastructure of their comp of their country and some you know criminal or state sponsored uh, group wants to hack their infrastructure for a different reason. So a lot of companies are not here, but that doesn't mean that they were not hacked. For the, most likely, they have been hacked and they're just unaware of that these days. So as I said, prevention doesn't work anymore and we need a new attitude when talking about cloud security. Uh, today, when I talk uh, to cloud security professional, I have to, this is what I feel like when I describe uh, my day-to-day -day life and how I do, uh, how I plan security in the cloud. Today, the average um, enterprise has between 70 and 80 different security solutions means that you know their security engineers need a lot of screens open at any given moment. They have a lot of outputs and a long queue uh, of tickets they have to address. And even though they have so many security products, they still don't feel safe. They don't feel comfortable. They buy more products and their CISO doesn't sleep well at night. So why do we keep on buying these products instead of just thinking about a different way to approach this problem? And now the cloud, the cloud created us 
a new perimeter, some would say, but it definitely created a lot of new buzzwords that you're, you're all aware of, like serverless and Kubernetes and containers. Uh, but I say that the cloud is not a new perimeter. The cloud created us a problem of no perimeter at all. And this is what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to show you a few, a few examples of, of why we don't have a perimeter to protect anymore. We are losing it. It's really vague. It's really foggy. Uh, and there is no one simple way of, of protecting our cloud infrastructure. Uh, and before I dive in, I just want to remind you, if you're not using the cloud, about the uh, uh, shared responsibility model. So if in the past, when in the good old data center days, you had your IT manager who was in charge of, of IT in your organization, and if you wanted a new server, you had to be best friends with him because it could take months until you know you, you place your order and until it's coming in and until it, it, it's installed, it's gonna take months until you have that server that you wanted. Uh, and they were the kings of, of IT. You really needed their help uh, in order to do something. Today, it all shifted towards the dev teams. They run their own infrastructure. Do they do security? I don't think so. Uh, good job security for me uh, because they're just being really irresponsible about how they do security. They care less about security and more about delivering a new feature. Uh, so if in the past the world of, of the software and the hardware were the part where it still belonged to the IT manager, today AWS is in charge of the, the bare metals of the data center. We don't care about them anymore. All I have to do is just click and decide what kind of, of asset do I want to spin, what kind of operating system do I want on it, and basically that's it. It's that simple. Uh, but we still have a lot of responsibility about how we configure these assets, how do we allow and not allow them to communicate with the world. Sometimes we forget that, we just choose the default security configuration uh, coming with, uh, with AWS or Azure or you know, whichever cloud vendor you prefer. And yes, it, it creates a lot of problems to us. Uh, let's talk about one of them, identity and access management. Uh, this is our way of giving other users, other vendors, other third parties, a, a way to uh, get data or get resources out of our AWS account. Um, it's really good and it's really helpful, but unfortunately, a lot of people do uh, mistakes uh, uh, in their IAM. Uh, here is just one example of uh, users leaving API keys in GitHub. Sometimes we have reasons uh, to leave credentials in our code because we, we need to for specific reasons, but these credentials should only give access to very, very, very specific resources according to what your application needs. It should definitely not be credentials to your AWS account, but these things happen. Then I talk to users about it and they go to their GitHub and they change the code and they remove the hard-coded credentials, but they forget that this is a repository and they have older versions of your code. <laughs> so I still have access to some of your resources which you did not want to give uh, other people access to. So please, don't forget uh, to change all the versions as well. Uh, other things that uh, we have seen is hard coding uh, credentials again in mobile apps. And in this example, uh, we had users, we had um, developers leaving credentials that gave access to users' data. Uh, so you, you think that people don't make these kind of mistakes, but they do. So this is something you really need to pay attention to. Let's talk about storage services. Uh, so in AWS, we, know, we all know the S3 buckets. Uh, and if you log into Shodan right now, uh, you're gonna see a few uh, uh, thousand dozens of, of you know, S3 buckets logged uh, to the internet with a public IP address. And you can easily see uh, what kind of data they store, but there are plenty of other you know, uh, storage ser services in AWS or in Azure Blob or you know, whichever security vendor you choose, whichever um, cloud vendor you choose. Um, and these mistakes still happen. Uh, in Amazon, for example, uh, in, a, in, um, in Amazon, in this example, we had 
Um, uh, so I forgot what did I want to say about this one. But uh, in Facebook, uh, <laughs> they also used a third party in Mexico who lost data of 400 million users, which probably means that they have some of our data um, over there. So users very often make mistakes. Uh, the data I wanted to talk about before, uh, the example was uh, users uh, on their EBS leaving uh, keys, which they forgot about, uh, enabling uh, other users to just log into their AWS account very, very easily with no problem at all. Um, let's talk about compute power, which is also something very, very exploitable uh, in the cloud. Uh, we see a, um, a denial of wallet attacks, means someone is just using your cloud to do whatever they want and you're paying the bill. One of the examples is, of course, uh, crypto mining, which again, you're paying the bill and the hacker is um, is taking the Bitcoin or whatever to their own pocket. Uh, in, in the last couple of years, we saw less uh, ransomware attacks because it, it uh, required, you know, some interaction between the attacker and the account owner. So in the in the in this example, there is no really a, a um, communication required, I can just install or spin up some really high GPU assets, mine my own Bitcoin, mine my own business, and someone else is going to pay the bill. And if they don't pay attention to their uh, AWS bill, they're not going to know that someone is abusing their account. Of course, this is also useful for proxy attacks. So I just want to use someone else's infrastructure uh, to hack someone else and make it look like I had nothing to do with it. So again, using someone else's compute power is very good for that. Uh, we saw one interesting example with Tesla, who had a Kubernetes cluster uh, spinned up, but they forgot to put a password on their console. So someone was able to get access to one of their containers. The container had credentials to other AWS account of Tesla, and the hacker was able to mine lots of uh, cryptocurrency that way. Uh, another good example and very important one is using packages that are found online. Uh, it's really good and easy. It's also a headache to update them afterwards. Maybe it requires some uh, refactoring. So in one case, uh, we just saw in a Node.js package that uh, in addition to what it was supposed to be doing, it was also looking for wallets uh, and just stole uh, the coins that were in those wallets. This is what the code was doing additionally, uh, of course. Um, and then we recently saw a malware called XBoomer, uh, who is just using uh, uh, AWS infrastructure uh, in a no need to download kind of uh, kind of malware. So yeah, it's happening all the time. It's very easy. Now I'd like to talk about a real example that actually happened recently uh, to a bank, an American bank called Capital One. Uh, Capital One has a very, very strong cloud security team. So again, it's just another one of those examples where it's not a, some esoteric small organization who didn't have the resources to protect their cloud. They had a very, very strong team to do that. And still, unfortunately, it happened to them as well. So let's talk about the stuff that we know. What was the damage that was caused? Uh, so first of all, uh, user data of 100 million uh, users or potential customers, because it also hurt users who just asked for credit from the bank, even though they were uh, denied. So their social security numbers, uh, names, addresses, emails, and so on, everything was leaked. Um, they had more victim, victims, about uh, 30 others, including uh, Europeans, uh, Ford, the, the car manufacturer, uh, universities, um, so a lot of other, other companies that were hurt and, um, crypto mining as well. Uh, let's not, uh, neglect that, uh, easy money option. So in addition to stealing the money, the hacker also installed some cri cri crypto mining, um, machines on that account. So let's try to go over the steps as we understand them to how this attack actually happened. Of course, we don't have 
all the information about what, how it happened. Uh, there is some information available online and some of it we just had to kind of guess how would we do it ourselves if we were the hackers. So it started with a scanner that was looking for web servers that will, were vulnerable to SSRF uh, attacks. SSRF is a server-side request forgery. It means that I can, in a, in a certain way, it depends on the web server, I can get to the backend server and make it make requests that I actually told them to do. So in this case, the hacker found a bunch of uh, web server that again were vulnerable in the application layer to this kind of attack and was able to create requests uh, using that backend server. Uh, in this example, the, the hacker made requests to the metadata server uh, service. In AWS, there is a metadata service for every asset. It means that all the actions and all the information about that asset uh, live in that server. And you can actually make requests like, show me what kind of credentials do we have? Or tell me the last action that was taken on the server and so on. And this attack shows very good understanding of how uh, AWS works and how it can be uh, exploited. So the metadata service. In this case, the hacker was able to ask for uh, tokens. Now, it's really small, so you can't see, but I'm going to show you a video in a couple of minutes. I, we created um, a fake uh, web page just to try how this attack is going to work. And we made a request to the metadata server. It looks really small, but you can see the IP address. It's, it's always the same IP address for the metadata server because it's, a, it's an internal IP address. And then uh, you can see in the URL, it says metadata. And then underneath, you can see all the stuff you can ask from the metadata uh, service. So you can ask for credentials, you can ask for IAM, uh, you can ask for IP addresses and so on. Everything just appears here. So the next phase was obviously to ask for credentials. Uh, and you can see uh, on the top security credentials. And we named our credentials bedroll uh, wide S3 access. Uh, this was our role. And uh, we were able to ask for a token with this, uh, with this kind of credentials. So you, all, all you have to write in the URL is security credentials. And this is, this is a token. This is a real token that you just copy paste and use for whatever you want to do. And so now we have a token and we have access uh, to the AWS account. So all we have to do is list all the S3 buckets as the hacker did, and then sync them. It means that we download everything that the hacker had, that the, the S3 bucket has to the hacker's um, computer. It's really that simple. And of course, don't forget to install your miners just in case. Uh, so this is what happened in this hack. And could this have been prevented? Um, or what should you be doing to prevent this kind of attack? So first of all, you need to know the roles that you have in your account. Because in this example, a web server had a role with access to all the S3 buckets of the account, instead of just having access to the bucket that had the JavaScript code and the images that the web server needed. So know what kind of roles you have, and obviously don't give too broad permissions uh, if it's unnecessary. Uh, the least privilege principle, of course, uh, don't give to users or machines access they don't need to areas in your application they don't need. It's, it goes the same for users who don't need access to the production environment or to specific databases in your production environment. Um, monitor who is running comments and where they do it from. One of the things we noticed uh, while doing this research was that, first of all, the hacker was using Tor. And you know, Tor has their the nodes available online. So this is some, you can kind of hold the uh, updated list of, of Tor nodes and notice when someone is using Tor when they try to access your application. You might want to allow it, you might not. And you might want to say that, okay, um, 
using Tor by itself is not a bad thing, but if I see someone trying to access uh, our AWS account from a Tor IP address, then this is weird because my DevOps engineers are not using Tor or I don't expect to see any uh, token creation uh, with a Tor IP address. So this is something you can very, very easily identify and, and prevent any further malicious activity in your account. And this is what uh, the, the log of this activity um, looked like. It's a real AWS log from CloudTrail. And in this case, we were able to see that where you see I and uh, 01C, this is the name of the machine uh, that the hacker was trying to get to. Of course, this is just a simulation that we created. It's not a real log from the real hack. Uh, but we see some kind of weird string coming before, and it means that someone is trying to assume that role. It's not the real uh, machine trying to make that, that action. It's someone else assuming the role of that machine. So again, you have all the data in your logs. You just need to know what you're looking for. And as, we, as you can see, we, I talked about the bad role with YS3 access. You can see that this is the role that was used um, in this activity. And then uh, I can, the, the log is very big, so I just split it uh, to two parts. So in this part, I can see uh, the IP address that uh, that the hacker was trying to work from. And then I see uh, that it was using Kali. Uh, again, you need to know your developers and I assume most of them are not using Kali uh, for no real reason. And I see that uh, there was the CLI activity, AWS CLI. And I don't think that most of you are using Kali to make CLI actions with your AWS account. So again, this data is in your AWS logs. So it's very easy to create a rule uh, asking to see any action that was made with the CLI, with Kali, and to monitor that either these actions don't happen or that you're well aware if they do and you go ask that user, what the hell are you doing? Um, so very, very easily detectable. Now I will show you a short, uh, let's see if the video is going to work. This is our simulation of how the attack happened. Uh, this is uh, us show, showing that we have no access to an S3 bucket. We try to log in and we have no access to it. Just proving that we are not cheating in this demo. Uh, and then we went to the app where I showed you screenshots before. Um, and you can just, it's kind of a webhook that shows what we can, what we, what kind of answers we can get from it. And now we go to the metadata service and we see all the things we can ask from this, uh, service. So we're going to go for IAM. And we have uh, the, the bad role uh, credentials over here. So we ask for them and we're gonna get the tokens of the bad role. This is the token, it has a time to leave. We copy paste it and we go to our Kali machine to use it. Uh, we just uh, wrote a short script to, uh, you know, kind of create the, the token to be useful for us. We didn't manipulate it in any way. We just put it in a TXT file. And we're gonna run it. And we're gonna go to the S3 bucket and we see that we have access to all the buckets and we have a sensitive bucket of data. So obviously it's, go it's going to be the first one we try to, we try to get to. Now we try with credentials. 
and we have a secret.txt file. Uh, so this is how, uh, how we did it. Um, and it's something that uh, all of you can do at home in your uh, AWS account, of course. Uh, now, uh, before coming to this conference, I was told that, listen, since this conference is in Canada, how about if you talk about an incident that happened in Canada? So I was like, okay, let's see what happened in Canada. And I heard <laughs> about a, ba a bank uh, called Desjardins. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Originally from Quebec and actually one of the biggest financial institutes in North America. So it's a pretty big bank. Um, and just in June, we heard that it was hacked and the data of 2.8 million uh, people was stolen. And also about 173,000 businesses were affected by it. And now we see this number, 2.8 million, and it looks nothing compared to the 100 million in the US, but I think that uh, it's uh, almost 10% of, uh, of uh, the Canadian citizens or something like this. So here this number uh, means a lot. Um, and once again, social security numbers, names, addresses, and so on, uh, were stolen by this hacker that uh, acted completely differently from the hacker that we saw in the Capital One incident. Uh, what happened here? So as I said before, this was publicly published in June of 2019, but the whole thing actually started in December of 2018. Uh, when the bank notices unusual transactions. Now, I couldn't find uh, information about what kind of unusual transactions uh, were detected, but they were unusual enough so that the bank would approach the police and ask this to be investigated. And it was investigated. Um, six months later, May of 2019, the Police notifies the bank that uh, some of their uh, customers' data was found in the wild. So it means that the data was already exfiltrated and the hacker was maybe trying to sell it or just to spread it around. And then we all heard about it in June. So this means that it took the bank a very, very, very long time to notify its users that something bad is going on here. Um, and this is actually a, a question for, for people from the bank, like why would you notify your users that late? Why didn't you ask them to rotate passwords before? Uh, it means they put a lot of people uh, at risk uh, for a very long time. Now, we don't know exactly how this thing happened, but in this case, there was probably very good social engineering uh, because that employee, the hacker was actually an employee of the bank until he was fired because of what he did. Um, so he gained the trust of his fellow co-workers and for some reason they gave him their permissions <laughs> and then he was using everyone's and his permissions to steal data uh, and exfiltrate it. And actually the police found out that he was involved uh, with different crime groups trying to sell this data too, including street gangs and also international syndicates. So he was really trying from every direction to sell this data and this is probably how the police uh, found out about it and about the data that was exfiltrated. So to sum up what we talked about today, um, if the best ones are hackable, it means that all of us are, no matter how hard we try, no matter how many security products we buy, no matter how many people we hire on our security team, we are all hackable at some point, it's gonna happen to us and we have to be prepared and to have a good uh, reaction plan to detect it as fast as possible. Um, the detection and contamination time is too long today. Uh, recently, IBM uh, published their uh, data cost of data breach um, survey and said that on average it takes 279 days to detect and contaminate uh, a data breach. So this is almost a year. It's a very, very, very long time, a long time for damage to be created. 
Uh, you don't want to wait six months before you notify your users. You want to detect it as soon as the token is stolen from your web server, then you cancel the token and then you understand how it was even stolen from your web server. You do not wait until uh, the S3 buckets are listed and all the data is stolen from them. Um, faster detection can save you from very, very massive uh, damage. And don't forget that and use your logs like the cloud trail I showed you before to detect faster unusual events. It's not that hard. You don't need uh, fancy machine learning algorithms. I showed you the log, the data is there, the role is there. You can see that an unusual IP address is using a role that is very, very wide. You can very easily see that and you don't need these really fancy, fancy products. Um, how are you going to detect? So log, I showed you the cloud trail, you have the flow logs, you have many other logs that your security products and your uh, IT is providing. So keep them and keep them in a place where they're accessible to you. Don't just dump them in an S3 bucket and forget about them because in the day you will need them, it will be very hard to extract them and then uh, use them again. Uh, look for anomalies, as I mentioned before, it's really easy. You don't need the, the really fancy algorithms. You know who your users are. You know usually at what times they, they work. And you know for each user pretty much what roles do they need. So if one day they request for a broad role, you're going to know that, yeah, maybe someone is uh, working from home on a new project, but also maybe someone is using that user's credentials. Um, priorities. Um, it's very hard. All of these products create a lot of tickets for us to handle, and you need to prioritize. As security professionals, you know that the tokens are very important um, to handle, and we handle. We don't want them to be abused. I'm not saying that uh, patching machines is not important. It's also very important. But my guess is that each and every one of you has dozens of machines with hundreds of uh, patches needed to, needs to be, that needs to be in, installed. Um, so prioritize, don't neglect that, but uh, we need to uh, decide according to each organization what is more dangerous to you. Uh, and the last thing is automate response if possible. Uh, the credentials example that I mentioned, yes, if you will create a rule that if someone is requesting for a token, using a Tor node, you will uh, stop the session. I don't think it will create a damage to your production environment. So I think it's okay to create an automation that if this happens, uh, delete this token or uh, do something uh, like invoke this user or do something like that. Uh, you can automate the really dangerous activities that are happening in your account because I expect that they happen very rarely. Uh, you can also automate the very the, the things that happen 20 times a day and you also always respond in the same way. This is also very easy to automate and this will save you a lot of time and leave you enough time to handle the really serious and unusual events that happen in your account. That's it. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure to be here. And I think we have time for questions, so I can take them here or outside. <laughs>